all we are you know uh, grateful to all the audience and to the participants uh, i think it's it's a quite number a uh, good number i can see those who have joined directly and some of you are joining through facebook live thank you all it is great uh, like uh, any other great uh, days international day we are we are, we are celebrating this world nature conservation day we have very eminent uh, panel including uh, professor riman subhatak director icr laboratory in pune we have dr beachle georgi who is co chair of total ecosystems and entities in usa usa we have professor govin chakrapani vice chancellor of vairampur university odisha we have professor narpat singh shekhawat who is eminent uh, professor retired from jodhpur university chennai and university jodhpur india uh then we have very active young uh, environmentalist dr neha sina from society uh society in, in bombay uh, society for history she has done a lot of work on environment we have dr pusha nina our colleague from school of environmental sciences then we have a young colleague young student working in a school for young holistic program of this school uh, shipra lakshmi and uh, saham ansari then program officer of ns is swati singh let me tell you this uh, the celebrations for And under the umbrella of this NVS SES and Young Holistic Program, we are uh, regular practice after uh, my youth meeting last year. We have celebrated several uh, function days and other functions, conducted a lot of uh, competitions, in group uh, involving you know students, and it's not limited to this. just to brief you young holistic program is a part of holistic environmental approach it's a outreach program of the school where uh, leadership is given to the student and student they perform different activities they organize and then it's a platform for uh, all round development of personality of student including stage fear the leadership organizing skills coordination skills so all this so it has around 30 activities uh, each activity is given in a leader here we have two young volunteer and leaders you know leaders and uh, i try to include you know three generations in this panel so including school faculty outside so this is you can see clear cut uh, from the poster that uh, there is a three tier uh, expert arrangement one real expert then medium class and then those who are just entering in the field so this kind of combination i usually try in all kind of webinar and these online meetings this type of meeting now coming to this uh, the theme of this is the nature conservation approach for sustainable future everybody hello hello clean mute mute your mic so now that is sometime online i had so uh party please do that yes sir so coming to this theme is very much known to us most of us we are working on this aspect of the many projects we are doing activities we are doing for this there is nothing new but 
as a dedicated day, we have to see the ideas and the uh, thoughts uh, from experts uh, in what way we are going to conserve nature and what are the new remedies as, as for the modern studies of the science and its advancement to the really technique and technologies. Uh, but let me tell you before the man thinks about that, uh, mankind is not able to uh, foresee what the nature has taught us. This pandemic shutdown has taught us new lesson, new normal, and how to conjure nature. If man is failing to conjure uh, nature itself, you know, make that arrangement and it has made it through coronavirus shutdown. It has uh, got in all type of conditions by force. So kind of, you know, rejuvenation of nature. This is how natural conservation. So today we are only focusing on man with what we should do because we have a lot of harm to the nature. So I will show you some of these you go uh, look at this slide. This slide is one is global example and another one I will give you local example. What is taught by pandemic? If you look at this slide, it has taught us that nature can be conserved if you stop all these industries, transfer, manufacturing, aircraft, all this aviation, because they are a huge source of pollution. And because of that, everything is now on the turning point of the which has taught us that if you do not move, you reduce your necessities. Because whatever we are doing more than the carrying capacity of any system. So the whole year, these are the lessons that the R1, including uh, all R1, nitrogen, sulfur, every type of emissions you are cutting down, effluents you are cutting down, and you are thinking of you know, rejuvenation of your health itself, comfort, and a lot of, you know, <clears throat> every aspect. This is one example of carbon dioxide. If you look at Mauna Loa, March 2019 and March 2020, the one year difference, is there is a drop of CO2 here, the clear cut indicating that this is a mankind which is giving the trouble to the nature and that nature is now understood that it is not, cannot be handled by man-made efforts, so nature has already taken action. And now, other example, if you see the comparison of air pollution last year, 2019 and 2020 air quality index in Delhi and around these cities, you can say, it was in this yellow and orange, or now it is green and dark green. So it's almost 80%, 70%, with very high reduction, these uh, compared to 2020 and 2009. So this is something we have to see. And on these lines, you know, what any, even artificial things, man-made items also, they follow natural principles, natural laws. Like aircraft to be made, it is based on purpose. So similar example, very simple example I'm giving. So this is another example given by nature that if we want to conserve it, we have to have this new normal status uh, in future for sustainability, future for nature, for resources, for mankind or students or any kind of youth, because they have to see this benefit, they have to see this loss, they have to today come forward and uh, give, give the torch for that further and these should be linked to the expert comments given by you people on the panel. And with uh, these words, I now first welcome our first uh, speaker, Professor Iman Supata. Iman Supata. Professor Iman Supata is a very talented person, very humble and very high level uh, scientist, as you know, your panel, or anything. 
ਸੋਸਾਇਟੀ ਸੀ ਉਹ ਬਹੁਤ ਹੈ ਡਾਕਟਰ ਵਾਟਰ ਦੀ ਹੈ ਫੈਮਿਲੀ ਫੈਲੋ ਆਫ ਨੈਸ਼ਨਲ ਅਕੈਡਮੀ ਆਫ ਸਾਇੰਸ ਹੈ ਆਲ ਥ੍ਰੀ ਅਕੈਡਮੀ ਵਾਲੀ ਹੈ ਈ ਫੈਲੋ ਆਫ ਸੀਰਲ ਨੰਬਰ ਈ ਵਾਜ ਹੰਬਲ ਫੈਲੋ ਬੋਇਸ ਕਾਸ ਫੈਲੋ ਪ੍ਰੀਅਰਲੀ ਡਾਇਰੈਕਟਰ ਆਫ ਆਈਸੀਆਰ ਨੈਵਰ ਨੈਸ਼ਨਲ ਇੰਸਟੀਟਿਊਟ ਆਫ ਬਾਇਓਟਿਕ ਸਟ੍ਰੈਸ ਮੈਨੇਜਮੈਂਟ ਪੁਣੇ he was also director of icr national rice research institute katak he was professor in iri so he has several awards over the years the background i and uh, i request professor patak to talk about uh, the theme of you know how this uh, sustainable future can be achieved uh, through economic development towards nature conservation and how to solve it and what are the eternal complex professor part of please thank you sir thank you very much am i audible yeah i uh, thank you very much i think dr kula sir okay sure let me share is it visible dr scroll system no you 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 share only window one window okay mm. oh share only window beach wale okay okay middle option okay 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 is it visible now yes yeah okay thank you very much thank you very much dr kunal sister uh, for giving me this opportunity all my colleague panelist and particularly students who have joined today on this very important day of world nature conservation day as dr kunal sister has very rightly talked about how anthropogenic activities have been affecting the natural processes and we are disturbing the nature so i will be speaking just to take what dr kulesh has said to take it forward how economic development and nature conservation this conflict has been continuing and what is going to be the solution to end this conflict so economic development versus nature conservation solving the eternal conflict it is not a conflict of today or yesterday but since the dawn of civilization this conflict has been initiated when we talk of these two contradictory approaches of economic development versus environment conservation or nature conservation there are several approaches on which both these things differ in terms of priority in economic approach economy is getting priority over environment in the environment approach environment gets priority over economy in terms of growth in economy we want to maximize the growth in environment we do not want to maximize it manage but we want to keep it steady state technology in economy we want to use all kinds of technologies in environmental approach we say yes technology is good but if it is not good for environment we are not going to accept it for example in terms of fertilizer in economic approach we can use we propose to use maximum amount of fertilizer but in environmental approach we say no only organics economics is neoclassical over classical belief is unorthodox in case of economic in environment it is orthodox belief and in case of crisis in economic sir, approach we say sorry to disturb sir, sir can you uh, screen uh, like your presentation uh, whole screen is uh, visible just one slide is just slide show would be better option so that we can see the slides ah, also sir, you okay. please click that one uh, no actually uh, I, I have already put that, but I, I don't know how it is not coming. Cup, 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 go. Slide show. Yeah, left by cup and go. No, no, I, I, I already, I already did that. Let me try again. Let me try again. Sure. Can you see it now? No, no. No, no, you have to click uh, this, uh, th- uh, this one. No, no, I got it. I got it. I got it. Slide show. Slide show. I I did the slide only, but then somehow it is not coming to you. Let me try again. 
So I shall go to A window. Window and then. Then click the click presentation. Uh, then, then in that presentation, you have to click right side. There is a cup, cup sort of thing. Yes, uh, uh, yes, F5 yes. yes. Yeah, that's, that's fine. Let me see if it comes now. So on the left hand side, uh, right now it's like four, four to six slides. The, yes, 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 yes. This option. Is it okay yes, now? Yes, yes, yes. Ah, yes. It will come. Is it okay? Okay. Is it okay now? It is not coming. No, it is not coming. The slide is moving, but only a part is being shown, eh? I think all slides are shown here. Being shown over here, okay. Let me do one more thing then. Let me try. You click only one slide and yeah, yeah, yeah. make it on screen and then share. Let, let me try. Yes. Yes. Hopefully, hopefully, it, will, it, okay. hopefully it will come now. Yes, sir. Yes. Is it okay now? Is it okay now? Yes. yes sir. Thank you. Okay. Is it the next slide, Kim? Next, Second. you have to page down. Second slide has come? No. Oh. Oh, page down, page down. Is it moving? No? No. Is it not moving? No. I think. Move. Wow. Now it is moving. Now it is moving. Okay. Now it is moving. Is it? Is it? Is it? Now is it moving? Economy versus environment. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, okay. Uh, just to check, is it coming the next? The line below came. No, no. Only the heading development in economy and agriculture. Now slide the, three. Slide the, three. And now the graph came. India food no. production. No. no. Uh, that of course, so what I shall do then. I, uh, now it is okay. Economy. Now it is there. Economy and environment. Second slide. Oh, your 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 PC is slow. Yeah, yeah. That is the problem. Okay. So what I should do? What I should do? Okay, now you can go ahead, please. And what I shall do, Dr. Sister, I am sending the presentation to you. You please present it from your side and then I shall speak on that. Okay, that also, by the time you say something, because it yeah, no, 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 what you can do, you can ask the next person to start there. Ah, ah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. You send me on that. Oh, we have now. Greg, you you are available there. Greg. Yes. Oh, great. So uh, now we have. Professor. George Mitchley. He is scientist at US EPA. Okay. Uh, for 10 years focusing on deposition, nitrogen deposition, wet deposition. He co-chair for the atmospheric, uh, national atmospheric deposition program. Uh, in that program, they, there is a sub-program called total deposition. He is a co-chair of total deposition science committee. This committee focuses on the research needs for the field of atmospheric deposition, managing the total deposition measurement model fusion maps for annual deposition over past 20 years across the continental U.S. 
he is uh, very dynamic uh, in preservation chemistry and i would like uh, him to talk about you know restoration of uh, in was uh, uh, ecosystem after you know a uh, lot of increase of sulfate and nitrate and due to that as it was there after cutting off sulfur dioxide and nitrogen oxide us has got a lot of uh, you know improvement in soil and that really appreciable amount of uh, uh, this uh, efforts by NADP. NADP has got a very huge network across US. This is, uh, I think, the uh, uh, biggest uh, network. So, I request uh, Greg to say a few words about uh, it and uh, any problem comes, uh, I can share your presentation too. Okay, um, am I presenting now? <clears throat> Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. yes. All right. Please go. Okay, that's great. Um, thank you. Um, I really appreciate this offer. Um, um, the opportunity to uh, present. Um, my plan is to um, give an overview of the monitoring efforts, as uh, Dr. Paul Thresher said, um, to assess if ecosystem effects and restorations um, as. Um, uh, you may be familiar, um, there has been a lot of effort to reduce um, emissions in, um, in the United States, uh, particularly those associated with, with acid rain. Um, and uh, I will talk about some of the networks and uh, deposition. Uh, these are two uh, sampling sites that we have. Um, I'll mention and define these networks later, but um, this is a CASnet and NADP wet deposition site. Uh, in Colorado, um, you can see the Rocky Mountains behind it. Um, this is the sampling equipment here. Um, this is the NHP sampler. Um, we have a filter pack up here in this, uh, what we call the pot head. And um, then we also have a uh, lakes and streams um, sampling. It's called the LTM, um, which I will uh, also go through. Um, I do need to mention uh, the CPA disclaimer. Uh, this is for all. Um, employees of the agency that the views expressed in the uh, presentation are not the are those of my presentation uh, my views not the uh, views or policies of the uh, US EPA so uh, just to quickly kind of go through get everyone on the same page here um, we're talking about deposition this is a, a pretty simplified schematic um, you have come you know, emissions here from, you know, not only electrical generation units, uh, factories, that sort of thing, um, it's being oxidized uh, sulfur and um, oxidized nitrogen, um, but also from traffic, um, uh, very typically oxidized nitrogen, um, the particulate matter, and we also have agricultural emissions. Um, so these emissions get into the atmosphere. Um, where they undergo chemical processes, and then um, we're concerned with how they come out. So uh, they either come out via dry deposition, which is direct um, deposition of the gas and particle forms uh, to either vegetation um, or just directly to the land and soil. And the other form is wet deposition, um, where uh, the, the pollutants will um, you know, it could be entrained by precipitation or hydrometeors um, and come down as uh, what's typically called acid acid rain. And, um, you know, then you get deleterious effects on um, ecosystem and, and biodiversity. Um, you get uh, increased nutrient loadings um, and you have the problem of acidification of waterways and uh, eutrophication, particularly in uh, the case of, of nitrogen and um, and phosphorus. Um, so that's kind of what we're looking at. Uh, I just want to recap some of the major acid rain legislations. Um, uh, you know, pretty much the 1990 Clean Air Act amendments. Um, Title four of that um, that regulation was uh, focused on acid deposition control, and uh, those are focused on the negative af aspects of. Um, sulfur dioxide and NOx emissions on ecosystem health. So the uh, primary monitoring networks uh, that, that EPA and, and others are involved in, um, the Clean Air Status Trends Network, uh, this is CASNET, 
measures is the National Monitoring Network um, that measures weekly air concentrations of nitrogen and sulfur species. So that's mostly the acid rain precursors. But we're also looking at base cations um, and chloride. Um, and we use um, modeling results now um, to get dry deposition velocities, which we um, will can make make a hybrid of uh, the measurements and the uh, the model values. Uh, that is the uh, total deposition and measurement model fusion uh, that um, it, it, Dr. Uh, Kalthresha just mentioned, um, and we use that to estimate uh, dry deposition. So it's a it's a hybrid of the um, measurement and the, um, the the model. And uh, National Atmospheric Deposition Network, NEDP, uh, their National Trends Network uh, measures weekly uh, wet deposition uh, samples, so precipitation, pH, dissolved nitrogen, um, sulfur species, uh, base cations, and chloride. And um, this long-term surface water quality monitoring network program, um, which we call LTM, is a network of lake and stream samples. Um, this will measure uh, 30 30 plus chemical and physical parameters um, to, to measure um, the, the health of the waterways and, and lakes in um, mostly the northeastern U.S. So uh, CASNET was established in, in 1987. So this is a, a long running network. And that's that's very important, especially, you know, to, to monitor trends. Um, we have 40, 40 sites that have been um, operating for 30 plus years. And uh, currently, you can see here, this is the, the map of the, the national networks. We have um, these two are both NEDP networks, the AMON, which measures ammonia, um, and the NTN, which measures um, the wet deposition. And uh, the CASNET, uh, which I mentioned, is the um, the, the ambient concentrations and the, uh, the dry deposition. So what we use is this, this filter pack. We have these all throughout the country, um, so this is low operate site operator needs. Uh, we have site, site operators that are mostly volunteers associated with local agencies or universities. They go out to these sites, change out these filter packs. They'll mail them in um, to our central laboratory where they are analyzed. Um, and so these are the um, these filter packs. Uh, there's a flow that runs through them and they sample both gas and particle concentrations. So these are integrated on a weekly basis. So one one site visit per per week, um, which is is pretty sustainable. And um, we take that measurement, as I mentioned, uh, the concentrations from from those me uh, filter pack measurements, uh, and multiply that by the model deposition velocity to get um, dry deposition fluxes. So the sites that we have um, are are designed to be in remote areas. Um, they're away from known emission sources and. Um, we have them dispersed through national parks. So we're looking for regional signals. Um, this isn't necessarily an urban uh, monitoring network. And um, the, it's very important that, you know, the, the QA, the quality assurance is a very, you know, big um, part of our program. Um, as you might expect over 30 years, the technology has changed. Um, so we we strive to reduce any kind of step functions that you might see because that would complicate um, analysis of trends. Um, we also do measure ozone concentrations, and I encourage you to uh, visit this website uh, that we have. There's a lot of information there um, that I won't be able to get to today. And this is the NADP network. This is a picture of the uh, NCON sampler. This is a bucket sampler. Um, this is a, um, a sensor when it rains. Um, the, the rainwater will complete the, the electrical connection here and cause this lid to come off. In, in that case, the water, um, the precipitation will be collected in this bucket. Uh, the site amp operator will come once a week and, and mail this bucket in to um, a central, central laboratory, which is different than the CASNET central laboratory, but um, uh, very, very similar in what they do. And um, so that's also a weekly uh, aggregated um, sample of 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 uh, pollutants in in precipitation, um, and uh, the Amon network. So this is the rod yellow. Um, I'm not sure that if you're familiar with that, but here's a schematic of this that I brought from the NADP website. 
So this is a passive sampler. Um, these are exposed for two weeks, um, and they're pretty much just stuck in a bucket, an upside down bucket to shield them from rain. And uh, this is basically the um, the ammonia will diffuse into this um, kind of round cylindrical um, sampling cartridge and adhere to this this core, this absorbing surface. And these are detached every two weeks by the site, site operator, put into a bag, and then mailed um, to our central analytical laboratory. So um, I do want to mention the um, LTM network um, mostly. And so we had the national network for the uh, deposition coverage, but this is kind of a historical stream sampling. So um, in the early days of, of uh, you know, concern about acid rain deposition, um, there was a lot of areas of focus, especially in the Northeast United States. And these are kind of legacy sites that we've had. Um, the data is available here at this website through Science Hub. Um, there's 170 uh, locations. So um, they, they usually produce about 1,200 samples annually. Um, and uh, this is a, con a cooperative network. Um, so, um, you know, these all these organizations contribute to the operation and, and maintenance of this, this centralized database of lake and stream chemistry. So uh, going through some of the results, uh, this is an array here of uh, basically this top row is 1990, 2000, and 2017. Um, we have emissions here on the, um, the left side. And um, you can see that the emissions in SO2 have gone down quite substantially in um, from 1990 to 2017. And accordingly, this is the ambient um, SO2 concentrations measured from CASNET. And um, you can see that you know the the number of sampling stations that we have um, has increased, and we're able to get better coverage of um, our our continental United States. Um, you can see also that the concentrations have uh, significantly decreased in, in what we see um, on an annual uh, basis. And um, then we use those concentrations in uh, the Tdap measurement model fusion process. This is this is not Tdap, so this predates Tdap here in 1990, um, and that's why the, the different format. But um, this is the annual sulfur total deposition. And um, you can see the um, incredible um, decreases that are improvements that we've seen in sulfur deposition. Um, most of the um, electrical generation is in the eastern half of the U.S. This this what we call the Midwest um, and the eastern portions. And you've seen that the controls have really um, have really helped um, our situations in terms of uh, sulfur deposition. And uh, this is the same type of um, slide for um, EGU NOx reductions. Um, so you can see very similar results in um, the, the the NO2, and um, we've seen an eighty-seven percent um, reduction from nineteen ninety-two. Um, 2017 and a decrease in um, you know a 55 percent in total oxidized nitrogen deposition um, from from 2000 to 2017. So um, you know this is this is really looking good. Um, you know a lot of the, the measurements that we do provide accountability to some of the the, the research uh, the, the emissions reduction programs that have been impl impl implemented. Um, in the past, and um, we are seeing um, good levels of, of improvement. Um, one thing that we are seeing is uh, as oxidized nitrogen is decreasing um, and very, very uh, substantially, um, we are seeing that um, reduced nitrogen from sources such as uh, agriculture, and that's where the uh, AMON network comes into play. Um, very level to increasing, so um, we are seeing a more reducing environment in terms of nitrogen than we have seen in the past. Um, so there's a lot of research uh, currently on that. And um, just to look at the uh, improved water quality trends in the lakes and streams from the LTM data, um, this is acid uh, neutralizing capacity. Um, and you can see that this has gone um, substantially up. Uh, this. 
this uh, reference line of healthy aquatic, aquatic ecosystem um, is kind of a guideline, I guess a goal um, of what was, you know, thought to be a, a more healthy um, waterway. And you can see that now the ANC is above that capacity. Um, also concentrations of sulfate in the, uh, the lakes and streams have, have decreased substantially. Um, and with that, um, I thank you for letting me present. And um, if there's any questions, please um, let me know. Thank you very much, Greg. Uh, it was nice and uh, as uh, already it is uh, well published, we have reports and this is a very nice uh, message for our students. They can also look at the blue pollute uh, and uh, if you are very sincere, you can restore the system and that is what done by US and EDP and US EPA. Wonderful, thank you, Greg. And if you have any query, please do write in chat. Now, still, I am not in receipt of uh, Professor Patrick's uh, slides. So, I uh, now go to next panelist, Professor Govind Chakrapani. Professor Govind Chakrapani is the currently Vice Chancellor of uh, Ramburi University, Udisa, he is a very eminent scientist and an educationist. He is fellow of uh, National Academy of Sciences and also he is fellow of national uh, other societies. He has been awarded the National Mineral Award, which is a very prestigious award in India. Govind Chetrupani, uh, he has expertise in environmental earth science, surface and groundwater, environment impact assessment, biogeochemistry, chemical sedimentology. He did a post of marine sciences from University of Delaware in the USA. He has around 30 years experience teaching and research. He is uh, very humble, very active. I thank Professor Chetupani for letting you agree to deliver his talk, share his thoughts with our students about his area of health. Professor Chetupani, I request you to say a few words about the methods and modes of environmental nature conservation. I yeah. think you would like to talk about, you know, uh, about the food plate, right? And that, please go ahead. Professor Chakravani, please. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you. Am I audible? Yeah, please. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Professor Kursvist, and uh, um, greetings of Nature Conservation Day today uh, to everybody. Um, happy to be here. Good evening. And uh, yeah, I, I work on something uh, else uh, for my research, but uh, I would like to dwell on a topic which is very close to my heart, and uh, that is food. So, uh, how food is conserved or not conserved. This is my talk. And this is exactly not about the food as well. This is about the cruelty of the food that is on our plate, the cruelty that happens before the food. I don't have any slides. I'll just talk to you impromptu, whatever comes to me, and I'll try to relate it to the conservation practices. So I think we can have, uh, uh, you know, uh, I'll just try to drive down some points uh, for your thoughts and not necessary that I am very uh, you know, I'm not trying to push my ideals on you or ideology on you. This is just a thought that has come that uh, what's the cruelty that happens before our food plate and uh, not a part of conservation. 
Okay. So if you take, uh, you know, we are very minuscule. I don't have to tell it to you. Uh, you know, there are about 100 billion stars in the universe. And Earth is just one star of sun, which is a very small star, supposedly. The nearest, you know, the black hole that has been uh, in, discovered in 2018 by the Large Horizon Telescope, uh, the black hole is at a distance of 500 light years. The distance is that much. The size of the black hole is 300 million times of the Earth. And you can imagine how huge it is. And there are many such black holes and whatever even light cannot penetrate the black hole, it will be absorbed there and it will meet its consequence. So if you take the Earth, which is one of the recent planets, 4,600 million years old, if you write the history of Earth in a, in a textbook form, it will be 4,600 pages, each representing a million year. And the size of the book, let's say, will be one kilometer by one kilometer. And where do we stand? If the last space represents 4,600 million years, the human existence is as significant or in insignificant as if you put a dot on the very first space with a HB pencil mark, that is where the human's significance is there, right? But unfortunately, this human is trying to, you know, reverse what was there on the earth. So how are we trying to do it is, in the last few decades, especially, or to start with, maybe in the last century, we have been replenished, we have been consuming our natural resources, which are of finite value, right? There is air, there is water, there is minerals, there are minerals and there is uh, you know, uh, the forest, the biota, and all these are finite. And some of them can be replenished like water. Some of them are not, they are not recycled. They would anyway would have been coming onto the earth, but the amount of time that would have taken had they taken a natural path is different than what we are doing today. For example, the fossil fuel that would have taken for the organic matter to come up from a depth of a kilometer, let's say, of sedimentary column, would have taken about 100 million years. I am able to, capable of doing it within a year. I am penetrating the earth and taking it out in a very vigorous or faster way. So that is exponential. You know, the way, the amount of, uh, the number of people that were there during the 1940s and 50s has doubled in 1980, <clears throat> doubled in, you know, today it is doubled of that. Today we may have a population of about 7 to 8 billion people. To start with, we had 1.2 billion in 1950s. So such exponential rise in population also puts a pressure on the natural resources. So how do we do and what do we do? Do we have to conserve them? Yes, of course we have to conserve for our future and that's what are the sustainable goals that have been enunciated by the various United Nations bodies or the group of nations that come in time and again. So this insignificant person, I mean, uh, imagine the exponential, uh, how much exponentiality uh, plays a havoc in our life. If you take a simple A4 size paper, try to fold it twice, then twice more, twice more like that. If it gets doubled every time, by the time you have folded it about 35 times, you would have reached the distance of moon, 150, uh, sorry, 400,000 kilometers. If you are able to fold the paper about 52 times, you would have reached the sun. So that is the power of exponentiality. So we are exponentially increasing the population, which is putting exponential pressure on the natural resources. So the conservation has to come. So this natural 28th July, is always observed to acknowledge that a healthy environment is the foundation of a healthy life and a healthy society. So what are you going to do for our children and grandchildren? Are you living on earth which is as it is or are you living it in a bad condition? If we cannot leave it in a good condition at least, 
let us not leave it in a bad way. So that is what is sustainable. So I'm not focusing on the water or air or land degradation and all because many experts are there and we have been seeing it day in and day night. But one thing that is probably missed by okay, so most of the social scientists is most of the social scientists who are anthropocentric, so they assume animals not to have a sentimental value or emotional value or social value, so they don't consider it. So this is high time that we consider the animals and especially the animals that are on our food. 8 billion people or 7 billion people are eating 77 billion animals. We are butchering them every year. That means each person is taking off at least 10 animals per year. This is, I'm talking about land animals. If you include the seafood, sea animals, then it will be immense. So my question is, are they not of the conserva conservation practice? We always think of a tiger or a panda, which is all fine to preserve and conserve them. But are not these major creatures are also part of our conservation, should not be our a part of our conservation society or the cycle. This is an ecological cycle. Everybody is dependent on each other. And if we, you know, the, uh, the global farming of the animals, the commercial farming, which has also taken off since the 1950s, our eating habits have drastically changed. Our body structures have drastically changed. Our health has drastically changed, putting pressure on pharmacists putting pressure on our own stress conditions is all because the food habits that we have. So my contention here is that if we kill so many animals, is there an ethical way to bring them on onto our plate? That is normally licensed slaughterhouses are the ones which are supposed to be having the rights to kill an animal. Animals do have pains. There are not many trained people an animal they stun it and or they give a shot and then make them unconscious and kill that is fine because the animal probably doesn't feel the pain but what happens in our country especially and in some parts of southeast asia is animals are being killed in the shops openly on the roadsides animals are killed in front of another animal a chicken is taken out from a basket and getting killed in, in front of its own kith and kin a goat is taken out and killed in front of its own kith and kin. So what are we doing? So this system of animal breeding, caring and farming came in the 1950s by a department called as animal husbandry, which is the Britishers introduced. Husbandry itself is such a bad term. Husbandry comes from the husband, which is a wife as a husband. And the husband thinks is that she or she is the slave or property. So he is the husband to the wife. That is how animal husbandry has come. So it is time this Yoho group or the young JNU students that are organizing today about this uh, meeting, they should think about what happens to these largely distributed animals or can we not change our animal husbandry to animal welfare? And are they not part of the conservation practices that are uh, the guidelines that are frequently called for? So this kind of food habits, you and me are not there to dictate what you should eat or what you should not eat. Everybody has a right to eat what they like. But we have to think about the numbers that are there. You are creating an ecological entity separately. If you have seen the Gajipur uh, waste uh, dump that is there in Gajipur, all the animal waste that are there, the carcasses and the other uh, products uh, that are not being eaten or useful are thrown into that uh, waste, uh, you know, uh, incinerary or the municipality there, whatever way it takes care. You see that there are a lot of vultures and eagles there. And that has created another kind of ecology, may not be aesthetically nice to see, but it is definitely going to change the ecology of that area in terms of the living of other biota, the microorganisms, the other, uh, you know, the, the around that, the air quality, the water quality. So where is the conservation practice that we are doing? And my question is, if we keep on observing only National Conservation Day or Environment Day as Environment Day, and just don't go to field and try to apply it to the systems that are there and that can be made change, that 
needs a change, then we have to bring in, this is what is expected of the youth of today. Gandhiji has said that the country's morality or its progress or its greatness is known by the way it treats its animals. And I am very sure we are not very good in treating our animals well. We are just feeding the wild boars with coconut crackers so that it doesn't get into our fields, agricultural fields. If it is eaten by an elephant or if it is consumed by an elephant, it dies. And then because it's a large animal, we feel very sad for it. But there are a lot of small animals which are getting killed. Why the wild boar cannot be also part of the conservation practice? They may be large in number. In Australia, in, in uh, a few months back, the number of so much that they had to shoot them from aircrafts. Similarly, the seals are killed in the Alaskan region. And that is also made it into a sports. So, ladies and gentlemen, on this conservation day, let us think about those animals. And plants are also part of this. There are a lot of papers in nature and science and many other ecological journals you might have seen. A plant which is dead or almost trying to die, the neighboring plant supplies it with lechets and nutrients so that it survives. So plants do have the emotions. Animals have got an emotion. They are, you know, the way they love their mates, the way they love their children, the emotions that is there. So let us respect their emotions, let us conserve them. So my uh, parting uh, line will be, as Buddha has said, let's be humanly human to the animals as well and be kind to the sentinels. Thank you very much for this opportunity. You made. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Chakravani, uh, for your lines. Uh, and uh, I think the students will be humanly human to the animals and they will understand, they will protect wherever they go. this stage, you know, the lesson that they can learn right now, later on they have to have this implementation. So thank you very much. But in between now, we have some question for Greg. Uh, question is from Ankita. What is the cost of bucket sampler? Bucket sampler used for sampling. Another question uh, from I am I am. Common, you might have right position, and then another third question is about SO2. Please, uh, Greg. Yes, um, I am looking into the cost um, of the sampler. Um, if you have the laboratory analysis set up, um, I, I'm going to have to get back to you on that, um, on how much how much they cost. I'm, I'm not 100% um, certain on that. I don't want to give a wrong figure. Um, so if you could uh, send me an email um, address, I would I would gladly send you um, glad, glad that estimate. And um, the other question about the um, SO2 um, was a, it's a decrease. Um, we've seen levels in the eastern U.S. Um, ranging about five, uh, six to eleven uh, kilograms of sulfur per, per hectare, and that has decreased um, to um, look uh, quite a bit um, to one to one point four grams kilogram uh, sulfur per um, hectare by um, in in a nineteen year period. So um, very sharp decreases. <clears throat> Um, probably on the level of um, 80 percent reduction. Um, and uh, what about where to position, try to position one has It's clear with our concept on where and try to position. That is one question from Common Church. He's he also one Yoho leader. Before I'm sorry. even. Common Chaudhary, she has question for wet and dry deposition. Common Chaudhary, before Ankita Katoch. Five. Another question on wet and dry deposition from Common Chaudhary. Sir, that is not a question posed. She has just thanked Dr. Greg for his uh, presentation. Okay. Now another question. From, uh, no, there is no question now. 
I got confused with that. Now, are you ready, Usha? Uh, I am ready. I am just presenting. Just a minute. Yes. Now invite uh, Professor Himan Supata. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Professor. Already I have introduced him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hopefully now slides will work. Of course, the slides. Thank you, guys. Thank the slides you. are visible. Uh, yes, you can you can put Usha in the uh, slideshow mode. Uh huh. Slideshow mode. Yeah. Just a minute. Okay. Yes. Okay. Thank you very much. I think mm -hmm. I, I'm sorry for this technical hitch. Am I audible now? Yes, sir. Okay. Thank you very much. Usa, please go to next. Mm -hmm. Sir, I have moved the slide. Is it visible? No. It is the first one only. So just a minute. And now, just to. So now it is visible? Yes, yes. Now it is okay. I think I put your yes, on my side also. Uh -huh. Okay, I think to take the uh, discussion forward after Dr. Kulis sister's initial comments and then Dr. Chakrapani's uh, in a in a very very interesting uh, way and of course very realistic one and also Greg's presentation. Uh, let me take it a little bit forward about economic development and nature conservation as the question which Dr. Chakrapani was also asking. And you know, since the dawn of civilization these questions, whether we should be going for economic development or we should be going for environmental conservation or nature conservation, or we should be going together, that questions have been pondering by humans for so many years, maybe more than 10, 15,000 years. There is contradiction in both the thoughts. As I explained, that economic approaches always give priority to economy. It wants to maximize growth. It wants unalloyed growth of technology. It wants maximal input use. Economic economy is neoclassical. Philip is unorthodox. And they feel that every problem on this earth can be solved by technology. Environmental approach is different from the economic one. Here we also think environment is important, what Dr. Chakrapani was also talking about. We want a steady state growth. We recognize the good of technology, but there is not a blanket kind of faith on technology. We want more of organic use, classical and economic theories, believe in orthodox, and we feel that there, should, there would be crisis in the system if we go on all round development in the economic form. But most of the time, the environment is in minority, sometimes in marginalized, and economic aspect gets preferred. Very briefly, I shall tell you what kind of developments we have got in economy, in agriculture in particular, what we have achieved so far. Next, please, Osa. Mm -hmm. If you see this one, that the food production in India as well as the world has really grown up, not only in our country, but all over the world it has gone up. Agriculture started around 10,000 years back. That time it was a low productive agriculture. But in the last five decades, the productivity has really gone up very much. Next one. And we have achieved not only green revolution, but all kinds of revolution. We have got white revolution, blue revolution, yellow revolution, golden revolution, silver revolution, brown revolution, gray revolution. And as there are so many students have joined today, I shall urge upon them to go through each one of these revolutions to understand what these revolutions are. But to summarize everything together, let me tell you that this country, India, till 1950, it was a food scarce country. Then from 1950, we became a food scarce country. Then from 70 to 2010, we became a food sufficient country. And afterwards, we became food surplus country. This year, India has exported exported sizable amount of food. For example, we have exported around 18 million tons of rice this year alone. If you see the overall economic development of this country, our economy has grown by 90 times since 1950. Per capita GDP has grown by around seven times. And almost every year in agriculture, our growth has been around 4 to 5%. 
So therefore, the economic past is rather illustrious in, in any parameter. But the question is, can it be extrapolated into a promising future, which we had previously? Next one. And that was not only in case of India, globally also it has happened more or less same. Of course, growth has not been similar in every country or every continent, but in most of the countries, the growth has happened globally tenfold increase since 1950. Economies has also promised growth in 10 to 5, 3% to 5%. But the question again is globally, whether this illustrious economic past can be extrapolated into a promising future. Will that be extrapolated likely what it has happened in the past? So the point is food production is increasing, economy is rising, we all can see that. But what about the environment? What about the nature? Next one, please. If you see this, then probably you will be getting a very, very disappointing story in some of the cases, not every case. For example, water availability in India is reducing. We have already reached below 1700 meter cube and probably in next 10, 15 years, we will be reaching to less than 1000 meter cube per capita. And that is the point when a country becomes a water scarce country. So we're already a water stress country, but probably we'll be going into water scarce country. And this is the scenario of aquifer depletion. Most of our aquifers, particularly in northwestern part, Punjab, Haryana, Delhi, Western Uttar Pradesh. Here, the aquifers are depleting very, very seriously. If you can see some of these, the, the bottom uh, lowest one, right one, these are the number of tube wells, number of pumps which are, ext which are extracting groundwater. So you can imagine how much amount of aquifer you are depleting every year, which you are not recharging or replenishing, causing a serious problem in times to come. Next, please. It is not only that, the water is also polluted. Probably you will not find a single water body in this country, not only Yamuna in Delhi, which is polluted, but you talk of any river, Sadigram Ganga, Bambaputra, Krishna Kaveri, whatever you talk, more or less, our river, our lakes are polluted. Our fertilizer is also we are using in an imbalanced way. And if you see this global map, India is put in red. That means we are not putting balanced one and we are putting fertilizer where it is not that much required. So this is another kind of problem from fertilizer front. Next one, please. And if you see the atmosphere of all the countries, you can see that India's atmosphere, particularly of the indo gangetic plain, that is red. That means the concentration of ammonia in the atmosphere of indo gangetic plain of India is having more of its concentration. That is another kind of problem so far as air pollution is concerned. So this is another kind of worry. Next one, please. Biodiversity laws, as all of you are students of biology or botany or environment science, all of you know at what rate the whole planet is losing its biodiversity. And you also know the importance of biodiversity, not only for conservation of nature, but also for food sustainability and for many other very good uses. Next one, please. Major problem is also coming from the climate front. As you know, that climate is changing and climatic extremes are aggravating. If the business as usual scenario continues, then by the end of the century, probably we will be reaching around 4.8 degrees centigrade temperature. Rainfall intensity as well as frequency is increasing. And already in this year, we have observed two very severe cyclones, very, very severe cyclones. In a planetary assessment, what we have observed that the planet, the Earth, has already crossed three out of nine important boundaries. We have already three boundaries like climate change, nitrogen cycle, and biodiversity laws. We have already crossed. And we are about to cross two more, phosphorus cycle and ocean acidification. So once we cross all these five and four will be left, we are putting ourselves into a very, very difficult situation. Friends, let me tell here one more point that whenever we disturb the nature, whenever we pollute our soil or water or atmosphere, our poor farmers, poor people are war sufferers because they depend more on the natural resources. But the irony is they contribute very little towards the degradation of natural resources. So they are not the culprit, they are not degrading, but they are going to suffer the most out of it. Next one, please. 
And of course, earlier I was showing the story of all the revolutions. So the food availability was increasing, hunger was going down. But for last few years, for last five, six years, the hunger is also has started increasing globally. So this is another point of concern. Next one, please. And of course, uh, our position in global hunger, as you can understand. So the question is, can we assume that the economic growth, which we had earlier, which is destroying the environment, will it be able to support the future growth production, future population increase, and will it be a sustainable one? Will it be a sustainable development? Next one, please. So that's a very big question which we all need to answer. And there I come with the third approach, besides economic approach and environmental approach, the approach of sustainability. In sustainable approach, we give equal emphasis to economy as well as environment. We want the growth to be sustainable. We respect technology. We want to use the technology, but it should be green technology. Fertilizer should be integrated use of chemical as well as organic. Economics should be neoclassical. Our beliefs should be heterodox, not should be orthodox. And what we think that there could be crisis, but that crisis can be solved if we follow the if we follow the sustainable approach. Next, please. Before I go, and maybe I'll be taking two or three more minutes. When I talk of sustainable development, we need to keep these three points in mind. Sustainable development integrates economic development, not only your GDP or sex. It should include social development, equity and of course, environmental protection or environmental development. So economy, equity, and environment, and then only will be possible to meet or achieve the sustainable development goals, which all of you know very well, 17 goals, 169 targets. So therefore, before I conclude, let me tell few words, what is the way forward for nature conservation or for sustainable development? I shall just tell you five points. Firstly, we should follow eco-regional agricultural planning. We should not be growing anywhere and everything and everywhere. We should divide the whole country depending upon the suitability of growing a particular crop. And we should grow crops in those areas for which it is suitable naturally without exploiting much from the external use or, exploit or depleting or degrading the natural resources. Next one, please. Second very important one, of course, is... Next, please, Usha. Reducing the food loss, yeah. Reducing the food loss. You will be surprised to know that one third of the food which is produced is lost actually. So why to produce more food when we lose it? Whatever we produce, around 36% go to animal, 46% fed by people, 5% for biofuels, 12% for others. But in all of this, one third is lost. So reducing food loss should be one of the priority areas for nature conservation. Third one should be choosing local and seasonal foods. Very, very important. Not only from sustainable agriculture, not only for nature conservation, but also from your health point of view. Very, very important. Next one, please. Fourth one is, which I support what Dr. Kul Dr. Chakrapani was also mentioning about it, going for vegetarian and growing food at home in our local areas, wherever it is possible. Producing one kilogram of non-vegetarian food is 10 to 12 times more costly in terms of natural resources compared to one unit of vegetarian food. So wherever possible, we should be going vegetarian and growing food in our local areas in the nearby areas. And the last one is, though I was talking about economic development and environment, uh, next please, we must be using emerging science and technology. So many developments have already taken place. I was talking about all the revolutions, but several other technologies like hiding, stress tolerant crops, automation and mechanization, sufficient need-based input use, integrated livestock and fisheries, all of these technologies have already developed or in the process of development. So we should be using all these emerging science and technology to solve the problems and making agriculture or of, and of course all other economic sector sustainable. Finally, next please, just to conclude that the conflicts of economy and environment will continue. It started when civilization started. It is going to continue, it is not going to stop. But nature is the timekeeper to decide how long we will be able to go. 
business as usual is not working that we can see it is trying for an alternate approach and that approach is sustainable approach therefore sustainability is the solution but it needs scientific implementation not simply by our orthodox feeling it needs scientific implementation and ecosystem restoration by few examples which i gave is the key for sustainability therefore let us what we say reimagine recreate and restore to make sustainable nature to conserve our nature thank you very much all of you for giving me this opportunity particularly dr kulasrest and all my co panelists for participating in this very wonderful and very important event thank you very much thank you thank you very much uh, professor himan subhata and uh, suggesting you know four five options to conserve nature that is also and also emphasizing you know three r system and also the uh, point to emphasize which we have to you know for sustainability we have to put a part it not going just like you know theoretical way talking and we have to do work in the field thank you very much and uh, now i invite next speaker uh professor narpak singh shekhawat professor shekhawat uh, was very dynamic academician in jnaya uh, jn narayan vyas university jodhpur he got retired uh, in 2013 he was a professor of botany and head of the department he has been member of board of governance of bombay uh, board of governance in iit jodhpur and he has been member of state higher education council of rajasthan he was director of the internal quality assurance cell he is a member of nag national accreditation council team and uh, he has done lot of publication and uh, definitely he has done lot of field work uh, without wasting much of the time i now request professor shekhawa to share his thoughts and uh, suggest the remedies how to go for the certain professor shekhawa please शेखावत प्लीज हेलो शेखावत सर सर योर वॉइस इज नॉट ऑडिबल शेखावत सर मेरे को तो दिखाई भी नहीं दे रही प्रोफेसर शेखावत so his video is clear but audio is not coming audio sahi kariye sir I think sir, uh, uh, some problem in the audio. Shikhawat sir, can you hear us? No. But your voice is not coming, sir. Professor Shikhawat, voice is not coming. हेलो डॉक्टर मोहन सिंह सर योर गुड आफ्टरनून सर न्यूट न्यूट योर सर मैं भी म्यूटेड हूं और मैं भी साउंड इज ऑलमोस्ट जीरो सर आई हैव टू चेक दिस इंस्ट्रूमेंट फर्स्ट प्लीज चेक हां और सर कैन शो अस दिस फेस ऑफ दिस पेटेंसी हेलो या सर राइट नाउ इट्स करेक्ट वेरी गुड हेलो हाउ इज इट बेटर सर आई प्लीज गो अहेड ओके डॉक्टर हिमांशु पाठक डॉक्टर बिचले ग्रेगरी डॉक्टर नेहा सिन्हा 
Dr. Mays, je vous souhaite tout ça. Vous avez Mina, Sipra, Lakshmi, Sam Ansari, and Swati Singh. I am speaking from Jodhpur. I am retired professor of botany and I will speak of uh, desert resources and conservation and uh, protection of the bioresources of Indian Thar Delta. Um, before that, I want to pay homage to Kailash Singh the Sankla, who was Tiger Man of India. He was born in Jodhpur and convinced Mrs. Gandhi to conserve the tigers of India. Then there is another homage to Blather and Helper who wrote in 1918 and 1919. And this was published by the Journal of Bombay Natural History Society. And you will be surprised that these two persons traveled on camel back in 1918 and 1919 to survey the desert flora. Now I will speak about the By resources of Indian desert, um, the Indian desert and Rajasthan have four characteristics. The sand dunes, the Arauli Hills, arrival of Rajasthan Canal project, water from Punjab and Haryana, through Punjab and Haryana. And then we have water coming from Gujarat to Badme, Jaisalme, Jalore and Siroi districts. All these um, events are influencing biodiversity, agricultural activities, and industrial activities in Rajasthan. So we have to see many things. Say, example, Rajasthan Canal is bringing water from Punjab. It travels through, the canal travels through Punjab and Haryana. And uh, you'll be surprised that in Punjab and Haryana, industry and people are dumping polluted water in the Rajasthan Canal water. That water is coming in Rajasthan up to Jodhpur, highly polluted water. And this may create problem for people in the future. Nobody knows how much pollutants are being introduced in this system. It will create problem. Then you have a very interesting things about Rajasthan. Sometimes back, Professor Swaminathan asked me, why the farmers in Rajasthan do not commit suicide? You know, we have stress ecosystem, we have limited water, still the farmers don't commit suicide. So there are reasons for that. The farmers live with Mother Nature, use limited resources, and keep eyes on the environment. There are conservation practices in Rajasthan, one of the conservation practice you know about the Khejadli event when 300 people sacrificed their life to save Khejadli plant, which near village Khejadli, which is very near to Jodhpur. Then there are traditional conservation practices. There are some birds which are unique. Bunny, small bun, protected in every village. Then Khan is one small land piece which is devoted to some senior person. Then we have Bihars, here is jungle. And in Rajasthan you will find a paper beard or number of beards where um, natural resources are protected and nobody enters there without permission. Then you have Orans. Orans after the names of Davies, and therefore, these are bodies. Um, I visited recently to Bartmer, Viratra, Mata Oran, where which has, you know, the large number of wild populations of plants and represents the entire ecosystem of Rajasthan. Then you have Tannot Mata near, in this area near Pakistan border. That, uh, then you have Gantiali Mata in this area where white plants are conserved. Then there are very interesting things. I was born in 53 and I remember things from 1960 onward. You know, the entire Rajasthan, particularly sand dunes, were covered with a plant which is called as Caligonum polygonoides or fog, less green plant used to provide fuel and fodder. 
And after that, 1970 onward, tractor was introduced in villages. They uprooted the plants, and now the plant has disappeared from most of the districts of Rajasthan. It is present only in Badmer and Jaisalmer near Pakistan border. So, it's basically, I say it is just like Hindu Kush of Hindus. So, folk Kush of um, in Rajasthan. Then there is another plant, Komifora Mukul, or Komifora White Eye, Google plant, very rare and medicinal plant. Uh, I remember one village, Balarwa uh, near Osia, just met in 2000. There were thousands of plants. My students visited there, and recently, we, in 19 or uh, 2015, we went to the village Balarwa, and there is not a single plant. So, because of introduction of tractors and power of with machines and developmental programs, large number of rare and threatened plants, herbal and medicinal plants, have been eliminated. My suggestion is that whenever there is program of construction of, uh, you know, development, this would be consideration for the white plant species, and then this species should be protected. Um, Population, poverty, plundering of plant resources, pollution, including plastic pollution, that includes microplastics and now nanoplastics. Preparation for war, particularly because we are 1,000 kilometers border, we have 1,000 kilometer border with Pakistan, so all the time we are preparing for war and bioresources are under pressure. Then the construction of roads and buildings. So in 1988, when Kalash Singh Disankla was here, Biosphere Reserve was for desert area was proposed, but um, this was in 1988. But because of several factors, political, economic, and environmental factors, we have now 18 biosphere reserves in the country, but there is no biosphere reserve for the desert because of the fact that there are economic activities in Badmir and Jaisalmer districts. So, there are many issues. Um, then we established at Jodhpur Biotechnology Research Center and we tried to find out how to conserve and propagate the desert plants. I give one example of anogas species which is called as Dauda or Nidrok. There are six species in the Raudi area which runs, Raudi runs from Ted Brahm, Gujarat to Delhi. And it was less green and this was covered by Anobasis species. And um, it has problems of propagation. We tried to develop technology for um, propagation of this plant and Terry Delhi also developed thousands of plants of this species through biotechnology. Then uh, there, is, there are, you know, the tools and techniques which are ignored by forestry or research institutions. Say, example, the Komifora mukul, it can be propagated by stem cuttings. Similarly, Caligonum polygonoides, it can be propagated by stem cuttings, 100% success. But unfortunately, we are attracted towards foreign technologies or foreign plants, so we have introduced large number of invading species, including Prosopis flora has destroyed the ecology of Indian hard desert and it has gone up to Kanyakumari. Then we have Acacia totalis introduced by forest department and several research institutions doing research. And this is on the cost of Indian desert plants, Metinus marginata or Toad or Teperis species. And this plant is um, basically disastrous. Then we have a number of other plants which are being promoted for promoted for reformist games like uh, Jojoba, Jekopa, and uh, Jetun, the olive oil. And recently, we have an uh, emphasis on propagation of uh, date palm in our desert. Pakistan produces around 40% of oil seeds, basic oils, and it, is, it uses uh, enormous amount of water. If you go during January or 
February to March in Rajasthan, you will find that entire Rajasthan is covered with brassica sarsum or rice. It reduces the water and the water table has gone down to earth. It's a very challenging system. So what I am suggesting is that we should promote the traditional practices which are used by farmers, say example, in between the boundaries of farmers' fields, it used to be three to four feet made or barred. It was never touched by anything or anyone, and this was conservatory of seeds and wildlife. This has been destroyed. Similarly, there were kacha waves, unpaved roads running hundreds of kilometers from Rajasthan to even Haryana. Both sides of the roads were conservatory for large number of herbal and medicinal plants. Seropasia, bulbosa is one, and during last 20 years, these traditional ways are destroyed for construction of roads without knowledge, and most of these plants disappear. And similarly, these things are, you know, even at Jodhpur, Marcia Safari Park was constructed, Safari Park, biological park, and the park means only animals, and the native plants of Anogasis or Cardi or number of other plants were destroyed and even the, the, those who are organizing the system they don't know what were the plants there peas and all that so my request is that there should be development but we should keep in mind that development should be uh, sustainable we should keep in mind that our resources are not destroyed there is a bomb this is Delhi Bombay Corridor which is being constructed, and I'm sure nobody has consulted an botanist or biologist during the construction or development of this, and this will destroy the system. Even plants which are being planted, there are not native plants, and there should be promotion of the occupation of the native plants. Um, I don't know how to tell you that recently I went to Ganga Nagar, Hanuman Ghat. Surat Gad, Bika made, Nagor, this made and Bhad made. One thing I have observed is that there is plant blindness. People, even administration, politics, are very well educated. People don't know epicity about the plants. Uh, even at Mount Abu, I realized that the VIPs don't know about the importance of plants in Mount Abu. So my request is that we should remove this plant blindness from the minds of politicians, administrators, and even general public, because they don't know plants, and plants are just disappearing. And with these remarks, um, I suggest to the students of Delhi and young scientists that please visit Rajasthan and see how beautiful the state is. You have hundreds of plants which are medicinally important, rare and threatened plants, um, drought resistant plants, frost resistant plants, evergreen plants, and plant building fruits, plants eating antioxidants, nutraceuticals, fruits, vegetables. Rajasthan is one state which has the highest veg vegetarian population. And Rajasthan is one state where we have organic cultivation throughout the life. But in the recent past, in 20 years, we are overusing chemicals, pesticides, and the waters of Hanumanagar, Ganganagar uh, are now poisoned. I visited Hanumanagar and uh, Pili Ganga and Ali Ganga. Their farmers told that they are, have separate piece of land for their for cultivation of wheat for their own consumption. And those which are cultivated in the polluted soils, is market. So therefore, situation is not very good. We have pollution, we have destruction, but we should be very careful that we consult the local people, we conserve our templars, we conserve our traditions, we remember sacrifice of Vishnuri and Kailash Singh Sankla who protected tigers. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir, Professor Shagavad, for uh, your very good
suggestion for uh, different type question for you here is question for you he suggest the plants near coal waste thermal power plant uh, i don't understand the question please repeat he suggest the medicinal plants which can be planted near thermal power plant coal waste thermal power thermal power plant area is there okay. a medicinal plant it, lagani it can be google Okay. Google, or it can be Fog also. Can be one of the possibilities. Or if somebody is interested, he can contact me on my email. I will suggest. Okay. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Okay. Now I uh, invite uh, our next uh, speaker. डॉक्टर नेहा सिन्हा कंजर्वेशन एंड पॉलिसी डिवीजन एट द बॉम्बे नेचुरल हिस्ट्री सोसाइटी सी इज एलमनाई ऑफ डेली यूनिवर्सिटी एंड ऑक्सफोर्ड यूनिवर्सिटी इज रिसिपेंट ऑफ इन लक्स स्कॉलरशिप वेरी प्रेस्टिजियस सी एड सर एज बेस्ट फैकल्टी इन डेली यूनिवर्सिटी टू and she has been you know in different committees including e word india sensitive species committee and she has uh, written book she is also the consulting editor with the century asia and the world and uh, with this brief introduction i invite neha to share is thoughts and suggestions for our uh, nature conservation neha please thank you for having me sir and thank you to everybody for being here i'm just going to share my presentation yes please okay good i'm able to see it yeah it's okay oh, okay So, what I would really like to talk about today is um, contemporary conservation. That is the challenges uh, to conservation today, as well as the opportunities for conservation. And I agree with the speakers before me, um, uh, who all uh, spoken on different topics, but all have basically said that we can't just have one day for these things, and we should think about sustainability and native plants and. Uh, uh having integrated approaches uh every day of uh, of of the year and uh today i want to talk about uh some of these issues kind of blended in from the conservation conservation biology perspective so conservation biology is my subject and i'm going to start with uh, uh a little bit about uh, what one sees in delhi uh you know because i'm based in delhi many of us are in delhi jane is also in delhi this is part of a, a small project that i do which is trying to understand the ecology of a particular species so this actually is uh, the bombax seba tree the samal tree called samal in hindi also called the silk cotton tree and it flowers uh, around spring time uh, in north india and this is the tree in bloom it has these large flowers of various colors and that's of course the indian tree flower sitting on the same one so i'm trying to understand you know which are the birds and animals that depend on this tree and there are many indian trees like this one which basically flower once a year and that once a year flowering is a major event for the ecology of the area So that was the Indian pea fowl. Um, the, this, these are some other birds that you find on the samal. The first is the green blue eater. It's uh, that's the first one. One below that is the collared dove. The one in the middle is the red meat ibis. And interest, interestingly, this picture is actually a colony of ibis that uses the tree not to feed but uh, to shelter it, uh, right next to a big road in Delhi. and finally that's a brown headed barbet it's actually feeding from the nectar from the flowers now the reason i bring this up is because 
I'm trying to show us some birds or um, uh, wild animals that we get to see in our daily life. So a lot of us must have seen uh, the peacock and the barbed is definitely the dove. And the reason I say this is because we do encounter wildlife in our daily lives, but uh, we tend to make them invisible in our planning processes. And that's really what I'm going to talk about today. And in trying to understand animal behavior or the behavior of an ecology, such as interrelationships between animals or birds and uh, their plant hosts, or interrelationships between uh, a particular habitat type and a particular wild species, if we are able to understand this, it should actually help us to plan better for sustainable development. Uh, and these e ecological interactions should form the basis of environmental impact assessments or in trying to understand the impacts of large projects. Unfortunately, that uh, these kind of um, interactions are often missing in our understanding. The biggest challenge today is that uh, we are not able to uh, safeguard habitat. Uh, I think uh, before me, Professor Shekhawat spoke about how in Rajasthan, we, we have plant blindness. It's actually true for many other states. Um, we tend not to appreciate or understand the ecosystems around us. And not only are we not understanding them, we are also giving them away for large projects or uh, in kind of reckless forms of development that do not look beyond four or five years uh, in the future. And we are losing major chunks of habitat as we speak. It's happening every month, every week, due to uh, ministry decisions or other decisions that are taken. And uh, there are actually not so many big uh, contiguous habitats left in the wild anymore. Most of them are fragmented. There have been many, many uh, studies on fragmentation of uh, forest ecosystems, on the loss of wetlands, for example, and also the loss of very niche or specific habitats, such as um, intertidal uh, zones on the sea coast or even sand dunes. Uh, sand dunes today, I think, are a threat in the habitat because nobody appreciates them or tries to understand them. Um, you know, if one really looks at the trends in forest diversion in India, I'm just going to show you the figure for last year. So this graph is probably too small to be able to be seen. This graph is actually about a thousand square kilometers that was diverted last year. But I just wanted to show you what are the kind of land use changes that are happening today uh, in which forest land, forest land doesn't need, uh, need to be forest. It could also be a wetland. It could also be a desert. As long as it's on a uh, revenue record, uh, land record as forest, uh, it's called forest land. So it's uh, with the forest department. A lot of it gets diverted every uh, week or every month in various decisions taken by the government. So just to show you, uh, you know, how really, where really this land goes. And if you see this um, light green uh, part of the pie chart, the largest part, that's actually linear, linear infrastructure. And for those who can't understand linear, it's actually a very confusing term. Linear infrastructure is basically projects that fall in this line. So a road, a canal, a railway, uh, even electric lines are linear infrastructure. And India is in the middle of the construction boom. We've actually announced that we're going to have a certain number of highways being laid every day. And uh, even though it doesn't appear to be a big project, linear projects can actually be a very, very, have a very, very big impact on forest land, and they are the biggest diverter for forest land. And the second actually is also worth uh, looking at, uh, you know, uh, the second is actually hydropower projects. And hydropower projects, uh, which are dams, you know, are actually still classified as renewable energy, which is seen as a green thing. But uh, there have been uh, several studies that show us that hydropower may not be as green as it is suggested to be. And perhaps we need to relook hydropower because it drowns forest areas, it displaces people, it doesn't produce electricity, 
in as much as it is supposed to, the potential is never equal to what is actually utilized. And we're still, it's also worth noting that we're still losing land to mining and quarrying. And of course, we lose land to industry and uh, uh, to prospecting. Uh, the reason I'm showing this is just to give a big picture understanding of where does habitat go? Wilderness habitat, this is forest land. There are many other kinds of land which are not classified as forest land, uh, but are good wildlife habitat or wilderness habitat, and they are getting lost uh, every day as well. A lot of the desert or scrubland area is classified as baseland, for example, and it's not even in forest records as forest land, and that also gets diverted. And uh, I'm very glad that uh, Professor Sheikh Harvard spoke about uh, Rajasthan because I wanted to talk to you about this uh, beautiful bird. This is the Great Indian Bustard. And the Great Indian Bustard is named after India because it is primarily found in India. And uh, unfortunately, not a lot of people know this because it's one of those species that hasn't really captured the public imagination. It lives in deserts and scrublands and in uh, agro, traditional agricultural landscapes. And these are landscapes that are being lost at a very, very high rate. Uh, so we have intensification of agriculture happening. We have a lot of land in scrubland areas or desert areas being uh, put away for solar or hybrid power projects. And we also have a lot of grasslands being destroyed for making housing or making economic zones, etc. So the result is that this bird, which is actually a very unique bird, it's um, it's uh, kind of specialized for the desert ecosystem. It can't live in a forest. It can't live in a tropical area. It can't live in any place that is too cold or too moist. It is, it's a bird of extremely hot and extremely uh, dry areas. So it's, it's a big bird. It's one of the uh, uh, heaviest flying birds in the world and we have about 100 left in the world and they are in India and uh, right now this bird is uh, confined to Thar Desert as well as Kutch in Gujarat and earlier it used to be found all over the Deccan Plateau and even uh, towards North India and Central India. So what's happening to the Great Indian Bustard and why is it important to relook what we consider to be progress? So if you just take a look at these headlines uh, this is a very important, uh, you know, conversation that students and academics need to get into. We have certain climate goals um, in India that India has agreed for. As part of our climate goals, we have agreed that we're going to transition away from coal and we're going to do more solar or um, hybrid forms of energy. And the fact is, we are still mining for coal. I showed you the pie chart which uh, has mining and quarrying in it. We are still mining for coal, but we're also trying to develop solar energy. And unfortunately, what is happening is that instead of having decentralized solar, we have these huge solar cities almost, or these huge solar uh, parks that are coming up, yeah, mainly in Rajasthan and Gujarat. And um, when I say huge, I mean really huge. I mean bigger than cities. So for example, there's a renewable energy park coming up in Kutch it's about 700 square kilometers. So it's actually going to eat away a huge chunk of land in fact. And uh, a lot of this land, you know, which is good for solar is also good for the Great Indian Bustard. And the kind of um, players that you have in solar are extremely powerful. They're basically the whole uh, industry that's coming to solar now. And I just wanted to show you these um, headlines that are being made which have recently come out because the Supreme Court has said that the Great Indian Bustard needs to be saved. And we need to take electric lines underground. The reason for that is that uh, the Great Indian Bustard is not able to see uh, when there are lots of wires in front of it. Because, you know, these are typically the wires that you have for these uh, power projects. And it's not a single wire, it's a mesh of wires. And this bird is not able to look directly in front of it. Of it, it has binocular vision and it, it collides with the wires and it dies. And today with 100 birds left, we kind of can't afford to have, uh, you know, uh, these birds dying like this. So because the Supreme Court has said that all new projects in the GIB areas, which is basically Rajasthan and Gujarat, 
all the nines need to go underground, you had this kind of lashback from the renewable energy industry and also from policymakers and forest departments. So they're saying that India's green energy goals have a serious problem, which is the great Indian bastard. They're also saying that a giant poor sighted bird stands in the way of India's green goals. So now the question for the students and for any academic or scholar interested in nature is, can we have climate goals such as solar power, which actually endangers species such as the great Indian bastard? Is it okay if one goal works against the other? Or do we need to rethink our strategies? Can we just um, do these big projects, which everybody likes? The government loves big projects, for example. Can we just do these big projects without thinking about the consequence that it may have on biodiversity, local ecology, as well as the future? Because our future generations will not be able to see these threatened ecosystems and these threatened birds. And you know, there is a red list that is made for birds and animals, uh, the IUCN um, red list. But I do believe the time has come for a red list for ecosystems as well. So uh, it's very important that we should understand plant communities and where they are found. And it's important that we start um, uh, assessing ecosystems in India and find out which are the ones that are on the brink. So uh, in my consideration, I think a lot of coastal ecosystems, as well as some grassland ecosystems, are seriously threatened today, and it's time that we started uh, assessing them. And if uh, that were not the case, we would have many more grassland species. Today, almost all the grassland species, whether it's the chinkara, whether it's the great Indian bustard, even the Indian wolf, the lesser floricum, which is another kind of bustard, they're all doing really badly because grasslands are vanishing. And this is the kind of thing uh, the grassland as well as the desert ecosystem is up against, you know, these huge power projects that say that they are green. So this is a dilemma that we need to answer. The second thing I wanted to point out is we're having a very big policy shift towards what is known as post-factor clearance. So we have this environmental impact assessment um, notification, a law in India, in which before big projects came up, we used to do an EIA, environment impact assessment, to understand what impact the project would have so that we could decide whether the project should happen in that size or in that location. So the question was never, you know, to, to question the rationale of the project, but it was usually to see whether it should be in the location where it is cited. And now, you know, uh, the government is trying to push for post-factor clearance, which means they want to make it okay to have a big project and understand the impact after the project has been made. Because they see environmental clearances as a hurdle to economic growth. Uh, and uh, I'm very glad uh, speakers before me have already spoken about economic growth and what other kind of models we need to follow. I think we can all agree that economic growth at the cost of biodiversity, at the cost of um, species and uh, natural systems is not a good idea. But just to say, this is another thing that we need to uh, engage with. Uh, is it okay to have post-factor clearance in which you are basically basically unconcerned with the impact of the project and what happens usually if there's a large project that's come up without licenses or without clearances usually what happens is they have to pay a fine but if you have polluted a river for example or if you've cut down a forest like this is a jackal this is uh, from a scrub forest in north india uh, on the right that's a bird of prey the shikra these are all creatures of forest for example if you've cut down the forest and made your um, project over there, you, are, um, you, are, you may be fined and you may have to give money, but the money doesn't bring that ecosystem back. It doesn't bring the species and the habitats back, and it certainly does not uh, restore or remediate uh, the, the damage that is being done. So uh, this, is a, uh, this is a very, very recent development that the Ministry of Environment and Forest has put out a memorandum which is saying that you know even if the project is in a violation and in that it hasn't got a clearance it can go ahead uh, and uh, it can pay a fine so you give money for uh, polluting 
or for cutting down trees or destroying a, a, a wetland or a, uh, or a scrub area, whatever it is. And it is important to note, this is a memorandum from the MOEF right now, but before this, um, there was uh, an entire environmental impact assessment act uh, which was uh, proposed as an amendment, which also said the same thing. This was last year. This is an um, uh, opinion piece that I had written uh, saying that that particular draft should have been cancelled because it again said that it's okay to have post facto clearance, that it's okay to clear projects uh, to, uh, without looking at environmental impacts, that it's okay if projects come up and they can just pay a fine. So this is a serious issue that we all need to engage with because many of the habitats that we care about or the species we care about or the kind of country that we want to live in, in which, you know, there has to be a process in which things are done, a process, a procedure. Environmental conservation has to be a goal. Sustainable development has to be a goal. If these are the things that um, affect us or uh, the things that we think about, then it's very important to engage with these big policy changes that are being uh, proposed. And um, I don't. I work primarily on policy, but I don't want to talk too much about it because uh, it's a very heavy subject. So I'm just going to end with one more point. So the first point was that even today, when we have a lot of climate change, we have a lot of species loss, a lot of habitat is being broken up for uh, many, many kinds of projects, as I showed you. The second concern is that post facto clearance is something that seems imminent and it, it seems like it's coming and it's something that we need to engage with as scholars. And the third thing I want to say is that there are some land use changes that are proposed. Uh, this is a legal analysis done by me and my colleagues. It's appeared in Bar and Bench, which is a legal um, site. Uh, you know, in Lakshadweep, there are, there's this new land uh, authority that is being proposed. And in a nutshell, the land authority says that they can take land from anybody on the island for development purposes. And Lakshadweep is actually coral islands, which uh, are formed on an extension of the coral reef. So the land is actually part of the coral reef, and the coral reef is a living system in that it, um, it uh, erodes and it uh, rejuvenates itself through a natural process. And um, land is very uh, short, um, limited in such places, in such coral atolls. These are the only coral atolls that India has. And uh, there's a lot of water stress. There isn't enough fresh water. And uh, the new development uh, authority says it can take any land for development. And it also, you know, defines development as construction and concretization. There is no note of sustainability of climate impacts it's all kind of it's kind of a development that you would do on a land and not on an island uh, it seems to have been taken from some other state uh, development authority and before me the speaker spoke about how we like to import uh, foreign or you know other kinds of ideas and we don't situate them in our context and what is happening in luxury is actually a good example of how we do this in, in that we just have the same concrete concretization or same uh, building idea, building equal to development, you know. And we, if you give it, uh, if you leave it up to uh, contractors, they would like to, you know, pave and concretize forests also because, you know, it's, it's very lucrative. So these are things that I feel that we do need to intervene on because environment and politics are closely interrelated, uh, the two uh, always go together. And we want environmental decisions to be based on sound science. We want them to be based on evidence and uh, data and observations, natural history observations. But because we live in an imperfect uh, political system, we live in a democracy where many, many you know, considerations are there, uh, perhaps it makes it even more important for us as environmentalists or as environmental scholars to uh, go out of our way to at least try to understand these changes and intervene as is right. These are the three big points I want to make. Uh, there are many um, other issues, but perhaps for those who are not familiar, it may be 
complex for a 10 minute presentation, but you can get in touch with me. I'd be happy to engage on these issues. Tomorrow is World Tiger Day, and I just wanted to flag this point. This is a journal article I wrote on Avni Tigress. I think you all know about Avni. She was a man eating tigress in Yavatmal in Maharashtra, and she was finally shot after she had killed uh, 13. But the point I want to make is that we look at these issues as micro issues, as very site specific. But there are a lot of these macro changes that are happening at the landscape level, at the level of policy, which help in creating such conflict. So the way that large animals like tigers, leopards, elephants are being hemmed in because of the larger land use change, the fact that we have big projects coming up with no accountability. Um, and basically, they are uh, encouraged to come up without proper licensing, without proper you know, clearances. It is causing conflict, which is happening almost at a daily level. And the people who suffer this is actually people who live near those places. So, you know, conservation. Uh, one of the one of the unintended consequences of conservation can be that uh, animals are there and conflict is created, helped along by the larger changes happening in the landscape. So I just wanted to flag that, um, uh, you know, we, one hand needs to know what the other hand is doing. So, you know, we are conserving and it's very important to conserve, but we also need to address the big policy shifts that are happening because uh, what we want to conserve is not just the animal, but the ecosystem and the ecological links in the landscape. And if we, don't uh, connect the dots between the big policy changes and the small site issues, uh, we are going to lose the larger plot. And um, saving a tiger, therefore, is more than just saving sites. It's also the big policy. And the big policy includes what we do with industrialization. It includes what we do with environmental clearances. And um, I would just end by saying that environment should never be a post facto concern. Environment has to remain a key player in these large decisions we make for large projects. And because I know my presentation is extremely sad, I'll end by showing you an Indian pitta. This is a bird that comes to North India to breed. It comes from Central India, and it comes to the latitude of Rajasthan, uh, Delhi, uh, and also the foothills of the Himalayas um, in summer to breed. So this is actually in Delhi NCR, and it's hunting for insects. I'll just show you the picture. That's the picture. It has nine colors, so it's called Navrang in Hindi. It's a lovely bird, and it's a bird that requires complex forest. Uh, undergrowth, lots of leaf litter under the trees. So you need an old forest if you need to see a pitta. And it's also important to note this picture has been taken in the Aravlis and the Aravlis today, the oldest mountain range in the world is under great threat from mining, quarrying and housing projects. So that's another thing that um, needs to be tackled. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Thank you very much, and yeah, wonderful. And although it was large, uh, it took time, but it was quite interesting. Hopefully, students like that. And uh, there are some questions for you. You can read by the time I invite next speaker, uh, Dr. Ushamina. Dr. Ushamina is uh, working very similar to the work about. Uh, Conservation of nature in our school. She is faculty in the School of Environmental Sciences, GNU, and she has very uh, great experience working with IERI. She is uh, very famous and uh, likewise student uh, community. Usha Mina, please. Uh, thank you, sir, uh, for giving me this opportunity. I request you to be brief. I can request you to be brief. Hello, am I audible? Yes, yes. Sir, what are you saying? Uh, it is be, not be, be brief because you no, have to be yeah, yeah. So, yes, sir, sir. Don't worry, sir. I am 
because uh, I am thankful to my earlier speaker, Professor Bhattar, uh, Dr. Gregory, and Professor Chaturpani, and Professor Shikhawat, as well as Dr. Neha. Uh, they have already addressed the topic of uh, today uh, very well. So, very little is left with me to say. But since uh, being an environment uh, and this co coordinator, uh, we uh, have a duty that uh, why we have organized this program and uh, what is our motto. So, I'm just addressing that that uh, we all know that earlier speakers have highlighted the need of the celebration of this day. And uh, then IUCN has uh, uh, designated this day to create the awareness uh, of, about the need to preserve the environment and natural resources uh, in order to keep the world healthy. And uh, in that, uh, by celebrating the day, we acknowledge that a healthy environment is a foundation for a stable and healthy human society. Because uh, in this today's uh, COVID pandemic era, we have seen that how new emerging uh, pathogens were human as well as uh, plant pathogens were emerging because uh, we are increasing their uh, natural habitat. We are destructing that natural balance of the nature. And uh, this is the day that we have to uh, again uh, rethink that or again uh, introspect that what is the connecting between us and the nature. And as we all know that this five uh, cause five uh, elements, Jal, Vayu, Agni, Prithvi, and Akash, these are the basic five Panchtat, uh, which are uh, out of that the entire cosmos is formed. And they are the foundation of an interconnected web of life. And uh, being an Indian, and uh, as well as all those nations where this um, or text Bhagavad Gita has been uh, translated in other language. We all know that Lord Krishna has told that the I am the self seated in the heart of all creatures. I am the beginning, the middle and the very end of all being. And we, being an Indian, have this belief and we uh, believe in that. And because of that only the Mahatma Gandhi has said that I bow my head in reverence to our ancestors for their sense of the beautiful in nature and for their foresight in investing beautiful manifestation of nature with the religious significance. And we all know that now nature is so much part of our everyday life for all the Indians that we worship the nature in different forms. This picture shows that we worship the trees, we worship the raw mother and we use the different uh, plants for medicinal purposes as well as for uh, saying or paying our gratitude to God or to the nature. So in India, our ancestors saw nature as being the manifestation of God. They believed in that and always taught to pay gratitude to the nature. But over a period of time, uh, we forgot that what our uh, Indian... and we forgo that. But when we are forgetting, the world is recognizing that. We believe in the concept of Vasudev Putumgam, Sari Dunya Ek Parivar Hai. We forget uh, our basic ethos and now in a different perspective, this is the WWF in the IUCN collaboration. They again reinforce this one planet perspective, which reinforces on the uh, efficient consumption of resources, green technologies, preserve natural capital. So these are the facts on which now the world is again refocusing or again um, uh, targeting on them. And this is just to, Eva Wilson has told, nature holds the keys to our aesthetic, intellectual, cognitive and spiritual satisfaction. So if we want to start anything for the nature, then we can start from our own. First, we have to take an initiative as an individual, then it will be reflected in a community. Then when a community come together, it will reflect it at the level of state, then at the level of nation, and ultimately at the level of planet. And we have to do that because we do not have any planet B. We have only one planet, and that is planet Earth. And because nature connects our cognitive, affective, and behavioral component, and when we are forgetting this, then we reflect, when we are disconnected from the nature, that reflects through our anger, fear, and stress. 
okay we feel physically and emotionally better when we are connected to the nature okay when we are with the nature it reduces it has been proven scientifically that it reduces our blood pressure it our heart rate is normal our muscle tension is normal but and it's improved the functioning of our nervous endocrine and immune systems and we all can again experience in our thoughts only whenever we see a flowing stream trench us keep going it motivate us to keep going in spite of the obstacles and the boulder in a stream teaches us to be patient and strong amidst changes that is moving all around us but we have to be take it seriously we have to again connect all of us with the nature because it has its own effect if it has been visible in our children also there is one term nature deficit disorder when why it has it has been very much predominantly uh, doctors are diagnosing it in children because that research shows that when children spend half of the time there outdoors then they did it 20 years ago now most of the time and in covid pandemic also we that forced the children to be stick to their laptops and computers but that created a nature deficit disorder also so we need to bring it in everyday life we will have to respect our immediate natural surroundings because we have to create children because we know that children and nature are our future and let's learn to appreciate our appreciate our beautiful environment if we will show our children this type of nature we will take them physically to the such type of places like this uh, waterfall then whole life they will not forget that moment and if they will remember then that moment then they will do something to protect our environment and biodiversity with this if we want children to flourish and to become truly empowered as well as that let us love, allow them to love the earth before we forget or before they, we ask them to save it so we have to create that bonding of love between them we have to change their attitude because it is the basic principle in our life we conserve only that thing with which we have any love or, or any bonding so we cannot conserve the nature without forging an emotional bond between ourselves and nature as well and for we will not fight to say what we do not love and once we will gen- create that bonding of love between us and nature and um, between individuals and nature then obviously it will be reflected in conservation which has been driven by amrita devi in past and it has been uh, now a historical moment similarly gora devi in chamoli district have led that movement so sustainability and resilience will be achieved much faster if the majority of our population understand the values and needs of our increasingly fragile earth or value of our nature then first we need to take the all these interventions at individual level then at the community level it will be reflected then it forces the nation to do to bring the policy level interventions and among policies which is very much needed it needed needed at present is right to nature policy we need to bring a right to nature and because we have we know that rights of nature is a way that we are recognizing and honoring the nature okay and we are recognizing that our ecosystems not only serving us through different ecosystem services but we, in that way we are also preserving it for our future generation so it is uh, high time that we should recognize and honor the nature not for a one day but for a every day we need to recognize this and for that we need to we need to reorient our life and we need to use more nature based nature based solutions that only we will bring the sustainability that professor pathak has told that now we have to focus on that third approach economy and development and that to be sustainable one so for that we need to act to more are in reduce reuse and recycle this two are respect the nature and reconnect with the nature so this five now five are need to be our every day's life and for that we need to do different intervention like respect our nature means for full moon day we should have um, full moon day we should organize such uh, events like thread and needle on a full moon day or we should have a, or uh, organize a walk in a woods on a full moon day or like latest practices on sundays we should go on cycle so in that way 
we can generate that bond and we can do uh, a policy like intervention like protecting natural capital we have to achieve zero net deforestation and degradation we have to increase strategic river basin management we have to expand the marine protected areas their boundaries has need to be expanded we need to value nature in economic and policy decisions and we need to incorporate the few cost of the environment in every policy and by doing that we can reduce all our carbon water and ecological footprint as well as we need to reduce the food wastage that professor that uh, professor patak has told that out of five way one major one is a reduce the food wastage and it can be done at the individual level and we need to bring this equitable resource governance in a life that means we need to reuse waste we need to convert waste to wealth like these are the options we need to go for this we need to uh, support such type of uh, technologies or such type of products where waste is converted into wealth like a paper bottle a wooden computer chips and this recyclable mouse and so these are the options which are available now in the market so if you will buy them then in that way we are indirectly promoting those industries we are which are using which are doing recycling or which are promoting reuse so with this i just want to end and i just want to say so long as this land will have mountains forest and pasture that long with the earth survive sustain you in the coming generation this is the phrase of our uh, one of the shastra devi stotra and with this i want to thank uh, professor kushreesh to invite such eminent speakers uh, on the envis platform and it must have benefited all of us and all our students thank you thank you all thank you very much uh, dr usha uh, wonderful sharing of thoughts uh, on sequence we have yoho leaders young holistic leadership pra lakshmi shipaj is working for uh, organizing these uh, essay and uh, uh, quiz competitions uh, with the help of swati and this program so i request shipra to say few words shipra is a msc this year first year and say so to encourage her i have uh, requested to say few words shipra please are there yes sir yes please yes sir good evening everyone present professor umesh kulshreshtha sir our scholarly guest speakers swati ma'am usha meena ma'am and all the participants my name is shipra yohu leader and student of msc environmental science jnu on this auspicious occasion of world nature conservation day we have joined to share our views for importance of conservation of for sustainable future as per our theme nature conservation approach for sustainable future i am elated to be a part of such a wonderful event nature provides us resources for human survival and development but within a limit that it is carrying capacity so it's our responsibility to make wise use of resources which should satisfy the sustainable limit for environment protection and nature conservation most of the points has been highlighted in our webinar and i really thank our guest speakers for such a theoretical speech and i'm feeling inspired for with a fervent desire to learn more and more from them i would like to highlight few points like uh, dr gregory focused on the ecosystem restoration and the strategies for uh, the acid rain reduction in usa similarly the particular has uh, highlighted the agricultural points and uh, uh, shikhavat sir has highlighted how nature conservation is being practiced in uh, rajasthan neha ma'am has uh, very well explained the behavioral uh, ecology which is uh, really important for us to understand for such for such sustainable development so and i really like the concept of usha meena ma'am the holistic approach the cultural approach for the sustainable future now coming back to the yoho invest 
uh, UNVIS has uh, been organizing such an event in order to create awareness, support, and promote innovations, creativity, and contributions through organizing in environment activities. Under the valuable guidance of Professor Umesh Kulshestra Sir and Swati Ma'am to channelize the young minds. Thank you, sir and ma'am, for your valuable guidance. I'm deeply gratified. And thank you, special thanks to uh, Swati, ma'am. She has guided me really well in this uh, organizing this event. Now I would like to announce the quiz results, uh, which is most awaited and have been conducted on 27th of July all over India uh, for such a wide and enthusiastic participation. Thank you all. The winners are first position goes to Vishak Rathi, uh, Rathish Nair, Loyola College, Chennai. Second position to Subodeep Shastri, Jadavpur University. And the third position goes to Vishal Gaurav from Tech Ferry. I congratulate all the winners. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for participating. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much. Shipra. Now I request another Yuho leader, Saham Ansari. Saham is also an MSc student and she was also involved in this organizing the event and then evaluation and also making it, uh, arranging for this with Swati. And Saham, please. Yes, sir. Good evening to one and all gathered here on this wonderful evening. Myself, Saham Ansari, student of SES, JNU, and a Yoho leader for today's event. Yoho JNU Envis, that is Environmental Information System, has become a greater platform to all to outreach and come up with the environmental issues and events, not only in JNU, but at a global level, by conducting quizzes, essay writing competitions, poster making competitions, slogan writing competitions, and more. Well. It has given an immense opportunity to all to participate in the events and building up confidence and come up with marvelous ideas. I really appreciate the efforts of our Envis coordinator, Professor Yusi Kulshreshka sir, and Envis co-coordinator, Dr. Usha Meena Ma'am, to come up with such a beautiful platform. It's a matter of pride for me that I got the chance to be with you all. I would like to thank our speakers who spare their precious time to be with us. I would also th like to thank Swati Ma'am for guiding us and help us in arranging this wonderful event. Now I would like to, uh, uh, I, I would like to declare the results of essay writing competition. First position was is grabbed by Om Prakash Rajak of IIT ISM Dhanbad Jhar. Second position goes to Mukta Kumari Pandey, Department of Zoology, JPM College, Chhapra Bihar. Third position goes to Sartaj Singh, Department of Political Sciences, Punjab University. I congratulate all the uh, winners. And thanking you all. Thank you very much, Saham. Thank you. Now I request Swati Singh to propose formally the vote of thank. Uh, thank you, sir, for giving me this opportunity to propose formal vote of thanks. Uh, going uh, by order of today's event, uh, first of all, I would like to thank Professor Himanshu Patak, sir, for valuable insight and especially the points that he uh, had highlighted for uh, ways in which we can uh, take up na natural resource conservation that were really helpful, sir. Uh, Dr. Gary Berkeley, sir, for your study and how uh, I think a lot of equipments and uh, this would really help the young student to, uh, uh, to uh, you basically organize their research work and it was really helpful how uh, you are working on and the, your analysis was uh, very useful. Uh, Professor Govind uh, Chakrapani sir, your um, views and especially about the uh, cruelty towards the animal and uh, how we should change it from animal husbandry to welfare. That is uh, thought for the day I think for most of us to think about it. 
professor uh, narpat singh sekhawat sir your wide uh, experience and uh, the field work that you've done and shared with us uh, and the detail about the various uh, flora was very useful and it was like uh, right from the field so it was very uh, helpful for the younger generation uh, dr neha sena ma'am um, i think your presentation was re really colorful beautiful and so thoughtful so thank you ma'am and uh, these issues are actually critical and lot of thought uh, for the young generation uh, now i would like to thank professor umesh kulsheshtha sir my co coordinator for organizing this event so with your uh, guidance and help it was possible to organize this event uh, dr usha meena ma'am my co coordinator ma'am thank you your presentation was very um, useful in how you related various aspects of life to nature conservation and uh, in, um, actually a uh, lot of ideas for the young uh, students what they should do in their uh, daily life thank you ma'am um, the yoga leaders uh, ms shipra lakshmi and ms uh, ms saham ansari thank you both of you your help and assistance for organizing uh, yoga programs like the quest for nature conservation day and the essay competition Uh, without your assistance it would not been possible so thank you for and uh, really appreciated uh, such young girls and very enthusiastic so thank you um, i would also like to uh, thank all the yoho group members we have around 30 group and um, all of them constantly uh, assist uh, us and we have a very uh, good discussion group and all the student of sts for their participation in this Thank you. Uh, last but not least, my colleagues at the university. Without their support, uh, it would have not been possible. All the participants, we had quite a lot of participation in this platform as well as this slide. Uh, they were very active. Lot of questions. So thank you, thank you all, and you can fill the feedback form uh, with the latest link. That's that's from my side. Thank you. Thank you very much, Swati, and we will share the report of this panel with the major highlights. I thank all the speakers, students, participants outside. We have this time very good number, and uh, once again we will meet sometime else. Hopefully next year we will have repetition of some of the. And uh, I can see Dr. Mohan Singh from Indian Military Academy. Thank you, Mohan Singh. Some other are very known uh, people. Thanks a lot for making this event successful. Namaste. And I think some of them already left. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank Can you. Can you feedback you. This, uh, in the format? And uh, if you have any query, uh, we write, uh, you can contact the you know, uh, panelist or you can write to us. We can pass on your query. Thanks. Thank you. Now I can. Yeah, thank you a lot. Okay, uh, Professor Shekhawat, thank you very much. And uh, I think uh, Park Loan, thank you very much.